Oregon Family Law Series. Today we're talking about protective orders in the state of Oregon. These videos are brought to you by the Center for Nonprofit Legal Services in Medford, Oregon. My name is Ray Cherba. I am a licensed attorney and I litigate family law cases for CMPLS. As always, check for updates to existing law. In this video, we're going to talk about how to get help if you're being abused what type of orders you can choose from in the state of Oregon, how you go about getting one, and some voice of experience tips. If you're being abused in the state of Oregon, help is definitely available to you. You can call the civil window of your local circuit court, you can search the internet, and you should know that no court in Oregon requires a fee to file a protective order. The Rogue Valley has a couple of agencies that help victims of domestic violence. These agencies are staffed by very dedicated people. Community Works in Medford has a 24-hour helpline that you can call for advice, for help, or to get started in the process of filing a protective order. Grants Pass has the Women's Crisis Support Team. They also have a 24-hour helpline. Oregon also has the Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, and if you Google Oregon Coalition, it will pop this is their main screen. If you click on help, it will take you to this screen. If you click search by county, it will give you an interactive map where you can click on your county to get resources that are local to you. Oregon has six types of protective orders. The classic FAPA order, the Family Abuse Prevention Act order, which is the most commonly filed protective order. Then we also have the stalking protective order. Oregon has a law called the Elderly Persons and Persons with Disabilities Abuse Prevention Act. That contains a restraining order. We have the Extreme Risk Protection Order, the Sexual Abuse Protective Order, and the Emergency Protective Order. Regardless of which order you would like to get, the process for getting them is largely the same. If you can afford a lawyer, that would be the best thing to do because lawyers have experience and they can help you out. If you cannot afford a lawyer, a great place to start is the Family Law Forum section in the Oregon Judicial Department website. And if you Google Oregon Family Law Forums, it will pop right up. If you hit that top link, it will take you to this page, which is the Family Law Forums page in the Forum Center of the OJD website. And you can see on the bottom left, there is a Protective Orders tab. If you page which has all five restraining orders which you can get from this page you can download blank forms to apply for your restraining order or you can use the iform service which is available in this website where you can actually fill out your forms online minors can get protective orders in certain circumstances with a what is called a guardian ad uh, stalking order and elderly and disabled protective orders are available to minors with uh, the use of a guardian ad litem that is a guardian for the case it is an adult who the minor trusts and the guardian ad litem files the case on behalf of the minor to be appointed the guardian ad litem to help a minor file a case all you need to do is fill out I think it's a two-page form it is available in the family law uh, section of the OJD website. You just fill out the guardian ad litem form along with the protective order petition and you submit it all together. You will be appointed the guardian ad litem and then the minor can start the process of obtaining a protective order. Can minors obtain FAPAs? Well, the Family Abuse Prevention Act has a provision which addresses that. It's 107726, you see it on your screen. So if you're a minor and you meet the qualifications of this provision, you can file your own FAPA without a guardian ad litem. Now, the question arises, if you are a minor and you do not meet these, the circumstances described in 726, can you still get a FAPA? And at this point, the answer to that question appears to be no. That happened in the case that you see on your screen, a young man, used his mother as the guardian ad litem, and he filed a FAPA restraining order against his father. The circuit court granted that FAPA order, and the father took the case to the Oregon Court of Appeals. The Oregon Court of Appeals held that if a minor does not meet the requirements of 726, they cannot file a FAPA petition. 
and this case has not been overturned so it is good law in the state of Oregon so at this point it appears minors cannot file FAPAs except as described in 107726 so if you are a minor who needs protection and you do not meet the requirements of 107726 you should consider Child Protective Services, law enforcement, or possibly if um, if your parents have a custody case that can offer you some relief, you might talk to your parent about filing a motion in that case. The process of getting a restraining order is pretty similar throughout the state, although it does vary by county. In Jackson County, you want to get to court early to meet with the domestic violence advocates. They are rocking at eight o'clock in the morning and they can't give you legal advice but they can go over your form with you line by line they have experience in making sure that all everything on that form is filled out to the best of your ability if you get your submission your petition submitted by 10 30 in the morning that day you can have your ex parte hearing at one o'clock that same day if your petition is submitted after 10 30 your ex parte will be the next court day at 1 p.m at the ex parte the judge will rule on your petition and if it is granted you will follow the steps to ensure that the sheriff serves your protective order on the respondent that protective order will become effective when the respondent is served and generally after that the next thing that happens in these cases is there is what's called a challenge hearing which is when both people both the petitioner and the respondent show up and have another hearing the respondent has a chance to ask that the order be dismissed if you are filing a FAPA or an elderly and disabled order you're not going to have a challenge hearing unless it is requested by the respondent if the respondent requests it the court will they have a certain number of days to request it and if it is requested timely the court will set it and they will notify you of when the challenge hearing will occur and that is why it is important to make sure that the court has good contact information for you give them a safe mailing address give them a cell phone Oregon has an excellent text message notification system so give the court your cell phone number and then you will automatically receive a text whenever a hearing is scheduled in your case that way you can avoid surprises now if you filed a stalking order and it was granted you should understand that a challenge hearing is automatically going to be set you will be notified the day that your stalking order is granted of when your challenge hearing is going to be and the respondent will be notified of the time and place for the challenge hearing when they are served the protective order both parties have to appear for that challenge hearing and as I mentioned the challenge hearing is going to be harder because the respondent will be there this is the time when you want to present your evidence and your witnesses so if you do not know how to conduct a challenge hearing and you can't get a lawyer if you can get a lawyer get a lawyer for a challenge hearing if you can't you should take some time to do some research to learn how to conduct a challenge hearing check the internet watch some videos another thing you can do that's really helpful is you can go to court and you can watch some other challenge hearings watch what the judge does Watch what the litigants do and try to learn how to represent in yourself in one of these hearings. So what is important to know when you file for a protective order? Well, I think there's at least two things and they are what relief can you ask for and what elements do you need to have your protective order grant? We're going to go one by one. We're going to focus on the top three restraining orders here, the FAPA, the stalking, and the ED orders. We're not going to get into the bottom three orders so much. And the reason for that is because 98% of the protective orders in the state of Oregon that were filed in 2023 were either FAPA, stalking, or ED orders. So just to talk about the bottom three briefly, as I mentioned, extreme risk protection orders are when somebody is talking about hurting themselves or other people. Emergency protective orders can only be filed by law enforcement. So if law enforcement does get involved with you, you can ask them if they would do this for you or they might ask you. They can only file it if they have your consent. And the last one is the sexual abuse prevention order, which is for people who are being sexually abused. If you have questions about those three orders, you might want to contact one of the domestic violence assistance agencies 
Okay, so getting into the more common orders, the FAPA, what can you get with a FAPA? Well, FAPA can address custody and parenting time on a temporary basis. So if your FAPA addresses custody and parenting time, that might actually supersede your custody order if you have one. You can also get help from law enforcement to vacate the residence, or you can require the respondent to vacate the residence, stay away from you, stop hassling you, stop going to the places that you go. You can also be creative when you file your FAPA. If you have a child with the respondent and you want the respondent to be able to contact you regarding issues about your child or parenting time exchanges, you can actually write that into your FAPA. You, you can write that the respondent should be allowed to contact me via text message regarding only issues about our child and courts routinely order that kind of thing. In order to maintain your FAPA, you have to satisfy the relationship requirement in 107.705 between you and the respondent. And then under 107.718, there are three elements you have to prove to the court. And these elements must be proved both at the ex parte and at the challenge hearing. That you have been abused within 180 days prior to the filing, that there is an imminent danger of further abuse to you, and that the respondent represents a credible threat to the physical safety of you or your child. Now, everybody knows about number one, that you have to have been abused, but some people don't understand two and three are also elements. And it is extremely important that you hit all of these elements, both at the ex parte and the challenge hearing. Otherwise, your restraining order can be dismissed. So getting into stalking orders, the common definition of stalking is to stealthily pursue your quarry, but for criminal law, the definition of stalking involves threats and fear. And that is the definition that the uh, stalking order in Oregon adopts. So stalking orders offer a higher level of protection than FAPA in some respects. Stalking orders do not expire, whereas FAPA orders automatically expire in two years. Stalking order violations are also punished by criminal charges, whereas FAPA violations are punished as contempt of court. The relief that you can get from a stalking order is more narrow. You don't see in here things about making the respondent leave the residence, and that's because typically you wouldn't live with your stalker. Although uh, conceivably, theoretically, uh, a stalking order could require a, a respondent to leave the residence if you were being stalked by someone. Okay, the elements of a stalking order, there is a lot here. This is, this is extremely, uh, this is a complex area of law. There's a lot to understand. I can't really do it justice in a short video, but I will try to summarize. The law requires that within the two years prior to the filing, the respondent has engaged in repeated and unwanted contact with you or a member of your immediate family or household which alarms or coerces you that it is reasonable for a person in your situation to have been alarmed or coerced and that that contact caused you reasonable apprehension regarding your own personal safety or the personal safety of a member of your household or immediate family so what does all that mean? Well, higher courts in Oregon have held that uh, the repeated contact means at least two contacts and both contacts must satisfy this test. They must have alarmed or coerced you and you must prove that the contact caused you reasonable apprehension regarding the personal safety of yourself or a member of your immediate family or household. So that is a pretty high standard of proof. Now, as if that is not enough, stalking orders based on speech have to satisfy another test. And that is because in the United States, we prize free speech. It is constitutionally protected. So stalking orders based on speech have to satisfy the test you see on your screen. Now, if to explain the difference between contacts based on speech versus contacts based on action. If somebody comes up to you and takes a swing at you a couple of times, then you have two contacts based on action. But if somebody says something to you, if somebody writes something to you on social media or text message, and that's what you're complaining about in your stalking order, then you have contacts based on speech and you have to satisfy this test. 
and this is a very difficult test to satisfy. So be prepared to do that if you are um, seeking a stalking order based on contacts that are comprised of speech. Getting into the restraining order in the elderly persons, persons with disabilities, Abuse Protection Act. Uh, to qualify for this act, you must be elderly, which is defined as 65 years or older. You also must be, or, or you must be disabled. And that means that you have an impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. And you will be required to prove this at the hearing. If the respondent can show uh, that you don't have an impairment that limits a major life activity, your order can be dismissed. So just having a diagnosis of some condition may not get you into this act. You have to be prepared to prove at both the ex parte and the challenge hearing that you do have an impairment that limits a major life activity. The abuse definition in the ED orders is wider, so uh, there are more things that are considered abuse. Elements that you need to prove are that you have been abused within 180 days of filing your petition and that there is an immediate and present danger of further abuse. The ED orders also have something that is unique, and that is that an adult can have a petition filed on their behalf by a guardian petitioner. This is similar to what a guardian ad litem would do for a child. But in the ED chapter, a guardian petitioner can do this for uh, a victim. So if you have somebody in your family who would like to get one of these orders but can't come to court, you may be able to file as their guardian petitioner and get them the order without them coming to court. Okay, that's what we have for you. Thank you very much for watching. I hope this video was helpful, and I will see you in court.